Welcome back everyone to section number two. Here we're talking about sigma notation. And last time I told you we want to be able to add together lots and lots of numbers and that's what sigma notation is going to do for us. So our goal is to be able to express, to, to, <laughs> to be able to express sums, right? Uh, lots and lots of adding, right? In sigma notation. And then we're going to learn the rules, the tricks, right? The theorems of how do you actually uh, do this somewhat quickly. Okay, so the definition here that I want to give you, if we start off with AM and then we go AM plus one, right? So these are different numbers, right? So, and they don't have to be uh, sequential numbers or anything like this. They can be completely different. These are just subscripts because we're going to need a lot of different numbers. So, I mean, normally I would use maybe A plus B plus C plus D, something like this, but we may have more than 26 of those, right? So, and that's where the subscript notation comes from. It's just that they're meant to represent different numbers. So these are all real numbers. M and N are different integers, and we're going to have M less than or equal to N. And then the claim is here is our sigma notation right here. And this means, right, so you start off with i equals m, so a sub i. So I'm going to start off with i equals m. So everywhere I see an i, I'm going to put an m. And then the sigma, right, this means the sum. So kind of once you've plugged in m everywhere you see an i, then the next term you're going to add to, right? So this is going to be the sum. And then we're going to do the next number higher. So from m, we're going to go to m plus 1. So a sub m plus 1. And then we're going to do a sub m plus 2. And then we keep on going. And then this superscript here, this thing above the sigma notation, this n, this tells us where to stop, right? So we're going to stop at a sub n minus 1 plus a sub n. So that's where we're going to stop when we add together that nth term. All right, so this may be a bit confusing if this is the first time you've seen it. So let me just do a quick mini example right over here. So I'm going to do the sum from i equals 1 to 5 of a sub i. Right, so I'm going to start at 1. So a sub 1. Then I'm going to do a sub 2, then a sub 3, then a sub 4, then finally a sub 5. And that's where I stop because we have 5 up here. So that's where we stop. So this is how we can use the sigma notation. Again, these a's with the subscripts, these are going to be all different numbers. Uh, we'll see this where they come from in a bit. Okay, so this way of shorthanding, right, sums, uh, of many numbers, right? So this can be kind of as many numbers as you want. Is called the sigma notation. So and yes, it uses the Greek letter sigma. So that's where the that's why it's called that. Uh, and the letter i, right? So we see this little i right here. This is called the index of summation. And you can see it roams between kind of this bottom number, in this case it was 1, all the way up to the top number, 5. So we plugged in 1, and then 2, and then 3, and then 4, and then 5. Up here we plugged in m, and then m plus 1, then m plus 2, all the way up to n. So that's the index of summation. It's changing kind of uh, each time you plug in the value. And so yes, like it says here, it takes on consecutive integer values, starting with m and ending with n. Okay, so let's go ahead and start getting some rules, right, for this sigma notation. So the first thing, if you have this nice constant here, see is any constant, and you do a constant times a bunch of things, well then you can factor out the constant. Because again, remember, this is a sum here. So I can factor out the constant, so this is going to be c times the sum from i equals m to n of a sub i. Okay, so again, the first rule, you can factor out constants. The second rule here is that it doesn't really matter the order in which you add. And so we can go ahead and add together all of the a sub i's from m to n. And then we can go ahead and add together all of the b sub i's. So some different sequence of numbers here, so b sub i's. And then we can go ahead and add those two things together, and this will give us the same result as if we were to add together the a1s and the a2s and then the a3s or whatever, all the way to the ans, I guess, in this case. And the same thing with subtraction, that you can go ahead and you can add up all of the a sub i's, and then we're going to subtract away the sum of the b sub i's. So another way you can think about this is that you can kind of distribute this sum over addition and over subtraction. 
Now this will not work for multiplication or division, but across addition or across subtraction, it does work. Okay, so I told you that we wanted to learn some fast ways to actually add some stuff together. And so here it is, this nice theorem 2.5. C is any old constant, n is a positive integer, then here we go. If you want to add one to itself n times, so this is going to be one plus one plus one plus one, and again, this is a total of n times. Well, from back in the day, right, this was the original like definition of multiplication. This is n times one in this case. So that's just going to be n, which that makes sense. One plus one plus one plus one n times, that should equal n. So for instance, if you add one to itself a hundred times, you're going to get 100. Now something a little bit more complicated is when this is changing. So now we can say our a sub i's are determined just by i. So, right, so first thing I would plug in one everywhere I see an i, then I would add two when I plug in two everywhere I see an i, and then I'm going to plug in 3, and we keep on doing consecutive integers all the way up until n. So I might do n minus 1 right here, and then finally n. So something like this. So 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 plus all the way up until n. And the claim is we can actually simplify this down, that there's a slick way that we can write this. And this is going to be n times n plus 1 over 2. All right, and this is a theorem, right? It does have a proof of why this always works, but let's just do a quick example to make sure that it seems reasonable. So I'm gonna do one plus two plus three plus four plus five plus six, and is this equal to six times seven over two? So I'm adding up the numbers from one to six. So in this case, my n is six. And so that's why over here I have six, times six plus one, that's seven, over two. So on my right hand side, this would be 42 divided by two, and that's the same thing as 21. On my left hand side, let's check and make sure that I also get 21. So I have one plus two is three, plus three is six, plus four is 10, plus five is 15, plus six is 21. So yes, they do end up yielding the same result. All right, so this is, of course, not the proof, but it's a good way to verify that this seems at least reasonable. All right, and the final one, if you want to sum together not just integers, 1 plus 2 plus 3, but, but the actual squares of those things. So that's going to be like 1 plus 4 plus 9 plus 16 plus all the way to maybe n squared. So each one of these things is being squared. Again, I plug in 1 everywhere I see an i one squared. Then I plug in two everywhere I see an i, then a three, then a four, then all the way up to n, and that's where I stop. So, okay, that's this sequence of numbers right here. We're adding them all together, and the claim is this has another slick way of evaluating, and this is going to be n times n plus one times two n plus one all over six. You can kind of see these are somewhat related to each other, right? They look like they're friends. And again, I'm not going to show you the proof of this. It is a theorem. It does have a proof. But let's go ahead and just choose a number uh, to verify this. So I'm going to go up to maybe 4 in this case. So 1 plus 2 squared is 4 plus 3 squared is 9 plus 4 squared is 16. Is that equal to, and I'm going to plug in 4, uh, 4 plus 1 is 5. Let's see, 2 times 4, 2 times 4 is 8 plus 1 is 9 all divided by six. And so let's see here, there's a bit of cancellation. We can do, this is two, this is three, and actually we can cancel a little bit more here. This is three and then this is one. And so on the right hand side, I'm gonna get two times five, well that's 10, times three, that's 30. So on my right hand side, we get 30. On my left hand side, well let's see, I have five, plus nine is going to be 14, plus 16, that's also going to be 30. So hopefully we can see that this is at least reasonable. So again, we are now learning, this is the important stuff right here, we are learning how to, instead of adding together lots and lots of numbers, right, we can do this very, very quickly by this expression on the right-hand side. 
Right? This is way easier than adding together a bunch of numbers, because again, there can be a hundred numbers here, there can be a thousand, there can be a million, there could be as many as you want, really. But now this is much easier to evaluate. All right, let's get a little practice. Let's do some examples here. So the first off, let's go ahead and write the sum in sigma notation. So I see three and then four, and I presume there's five and then six, and then all the way up until 25. So this is going to be summing together and my i index, right, I think it's going to start here maybe at 3, and then it's going to end at 25, right, because these seem to be jumping by 1s. So start at 3 and end at 25. Now, it's not just that I'm summing together i's, right, because that would be 3 plus 4 plus 5 plus 6 all the way up until 25, but it's the square root of each one of these things. So it's going to be the square root of i. All right, and that's all there is to it. Let's go ahead and verify our work, though, really quick. So the first thing I do is I plug in 3 everywhere I see an i, so this is going to be root 3. And then I add together when I plug in 4, so this is going to be root 4. And then I would have root 5. And then we keep on going all the way until root 25. And so, yes, it does seem like I'm getting the right thing. So a lot of this is kind of a guess and check. We guess what the sum is, and then we check and make sure that it lines up with what we want. Okay, evaluate the following sum. So now we're actually using the sigma notation stuff, and we'd like to evaluate. All right, so for this one, it's from i equals 1 to i equals 4. And these are actually small enough values here that I can just plug them in. So let's go ahead and see just by plugging this in. So if I plug in i equals 1, so I'd have 2 minus 3, okay? Next, if I plugged in i equals 2, I would have 2 minus, okay, 3 times 2 would be 6, fair enough. Next up, if I plugged in i equals 3, I would have 2 minus, 3 times 3 is going to be 9. And then finally, if I plugged in 4, I would have 2 minus 3 times 4, 12. And so now I can evaluate this. This is going to be negative 1 plus negative 4 plus negative 7 plus negative 10. And so let's see, we have negative 5, negative 12, negative 22 altogether. So there's my final result that we get negative 22. And when you have these relatively small numbers, this is a possibility. But now look, I have i equals 1 to i equals 400. I cannot do the same thing. This would take forever. And so that's where these rules on the last page become very, very useful. Right? So we want to use these things, uh, in particular to make this look like 1s or i's or i squareds. So let's go ahead and do that. So the first thing I'd like to do is I notice that, well, it doesn't exactly match. right? It doesn't look like 1s or i's or i squareds or things that I could apply the rule to. So I'm going to go ahead and maybe distribute this summation over the subtraction. Right, so I'm going to do summing from i equals 1 to 400 of 2. And then subtract away summing from i equals 1 to 400 of 3i. And now this looks a little bit closer, but I prefer this to just be i, and I would prefer this to just be 1. And so in order to make this just 1 and this just i, I'm going to go ahead and factor out, right? So there's this nice rule up here that says that you can factor out constants. Where was it? Here. Theorem 2, 4a, that if you have a constant, like a 3 or like a 2 or something like this, that you can factor it out of the sum. So let's go ahead and do that. So in this case, I'll factor out the 2. So I'll get 2 times summing from 1 to 400 of just 1, right? Because again, 2 times 1 would be 2. And then we'll subtract away 3 times the sum from i equals 1 to 400 of i. And now these look exactly like our rules or our theorem from 2.5. Here we have part A, if you want to sum 1 a bunch of times, right, from 1 to n, then you're just going to have n. And if you want to sum i from 1 to n, you're going to get this more complicated thing. So let's go ahead and plug in those things. So we're going to have 2, and we're summing up 1 from 1 to 400. So our n value is 400, so that's why this is going to be 400, minus 3. And we're summing up i from i equals 1 to 400. So this is going to be 400 
times 401 divided by 2. So again, everywhere I see n, I'm putting 400 because that's my kind of upper limit here. All right, so at this point, we can go ahead and take a line and simplify a little bit. So I'm going to do 800, and then let's see, 400 divided by 2, that's going to be 200. So and then maybe 3 times 200 would be 600, so I'm going to do minus 600, and then I still have to multiply that by 401. And now at this point, I would say you could leave this as your final answer. This is simplified enough, but if you'd like to, you can continue, right? And so I would do 6 times 401. So the 6 times 1 is going to be 6, and then we're going to have a 0, and then 6 times 4 is going to be 24. And so that's the 6 times 401, but this needs to be 600, right? So you're going to multiply by that extra 100 there. And so we're going to have 800 minus, and this is 240,600. And then we could do this subtraction. It's certainly going to be a negative number. 239,800 is what I get out. And this would be the fully simplified answer right here. So again, I would say kind of either one of these are fine for full credit. Now, of course, if you have like a multiple choice question or something and only one of these two answers appear, right, you have to know, for instance, if only this answer appears, then you would have to simplify it down. All right, so that was our last example for this video. Now we see how we can add together a lot of numbers. Like, for instance, right, we added together 400 numbers here like that. And so now we want to go back and actually apply this to our original question, which was area under a curve. How can we calculate out area under a curve using this newfound ability to be able to add lots and lots of numbers together? So that's what we're talking about in our third video. That's really the definite integral. I'll see you then.